All right, so good morning, or Ohayo gozaimasu for all the friends from Japan. Um, so yes, so uh, hopefully you had a nice uh, rest. Um, so, so again, my name is Guillaume Bourg. I work at the Genome Center. I'm uh, responsible for bioinformatics there. Uh, so I thought actually I would start with a quick uh, summary slide of the workshop as a whole. So this is actually not in your uh, in your slide, so you have to look up. Uh, it's not on your folder. So I added this slide uh, just to give uh, sort of an overview of what you did yesterday a bit and, and also of what we're going to do today. So, uh, you know, so there's really two components so, so to disease. But, so there's a genetic component, uh, which is really what you saw yesterday. Uh, first with, with Mathieu, who presented some basic processing uh, and with Sergey, who did more on the variant calling and the annotation. So this is really sort of focusing on the genetic aspects, and um, you know, and we covered quite a lot of ground there. Uh, again, part of this, if you're a bioinformatician, hopefully that's helpful. If you're more of a clinician, it gives you a sense of the kind of data processing that goes in uh, to really extract these genetic variants and and generate these uh, these VCF files that you can then look. Uh, and, and, and to, to try to understand disease. Uh, so today we're going to focus on uh, the more the epigenetic uh, component of disease. Uh, so, so in my module, module five, I'll do an overview of some resources, and then Andre will do something similar to what we did yesterday, which is uh, sort of look at some examples of really uh, data analysis and data processing uh, for epigenetic data sets. Um, yesterday, you also had, I think, a very nice overview of, of both sort of, 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 of how we use these data sets, really. So first, the module one with, with Mike, who talked about phenotyping and the importance uh, of really using ontologies and, and sort of control vocabulary to really describe disease, which is what enables then a lot of downstream application and, and, and enables computers really to uh, to explore these phenotypes. Uh, you also had, at the end of the day, if you were still alive, uh, a module on clinical implementation and, and looking more at uh, how do we take some of these uh, processes that we do in the research context and really develop them in the lab. And, and today, you're going to have another uh, module also at the end of the day with Anna that's looking at uh, uh, again, how do you use these genetic and epigenetic signatures to to build classifier to say this particular individual? So I thought, you know, so we, again, we're, we're covering a lot of things, uh, and hopefully you see the connections, and I thought I, I put them out like this just to help you. Um, but again, so like in my module uh, this morning, we'll focus on uh, just available epigenetic resources. Uh, so, so what are the uh, learning objectives of this module this morning? Uh, so understand why epigenomic is important for gen genomic medicine. Um, be familiar with epigenomic profiling technologies. I won't go in detail, but just, uh, just so that you're familiar with that. Uh, know relevant uh, data and web resources. Uh, and then be able to find. So in the practical... Um, this is going to be more like a web-based practical, unlike yesterday, uh, really just exploring available uh, resources. Uh, maybe before, before I start, so again, yesterday was genetics in terms of epigenetics and RNA-seq. So who, should maybe raise your hand if you have experience with epigenetic data sets or not a lot. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I mean, but, but this, this particular, especially my section will be uh, really an introduction to some of these concepts. So first of all, so why is, uh, why are we including epigenomics and epigenetics as part of this module on, epigeno uh, on genomic medicine? Uh, so uh, I mean, I, I can, I'm sure everybody's familiar with this, but of course, uh, genes and, and coding sequences only account for roughly 2% of the genome. The, the rest and the majority of the human genome is really about uh, regulatory elements, things that actually control expression in different cells. Um, and 
just to give you now a more concrete example of what that means, uh, this is an example of a study that we did. Uh, so yesterday was mostly about, so this is cancer, unlike yesterday where we were looking at uh, rare disease, rare genetic, but in cancer, if uh, we now have the ability, of course, to, to sequence uh, tumors. Uh, so this is a study where we sequence 100 kidney tumors, hoping to look for patterns of mutations uh, and recurrent mutations and identify pathways that are relevant. Um, so you see that so in, this, in this representation, every square represents 1,000 mutations that we discovered across these 100 tumors. Um, so you see that we, so we, we identified... Because, again, there's lots and lots of mutations. This is related a little bit to uh, what Mike was saying yesterday. But there's lots and lots of mutations, uh, and in cancer in particular. And so you see that we identify roughly half a million, over half a million mutations in these 100 tumors. But, but if you look at the, the fraction of these mutations that are hitting genes, that are encoding sequences, those are the ones in, in orange. So you see that only, as you would expect, only a small fraction uh, of all the mutations that we detect in these tumors are coding, and so those can be easily an annotated in terms of which genes do they hit, you know, what's the impact, and so on. But what about all of the other mutations? And, and similar to yesterday, I mean, it's expected that the majority of these are, are, are passenger mutations or not important mutations. Uh, that's true for both the non-coding mutations and the coding mutations. Uh, but but it's, it's also true that, that probably, you know, buried somewhere in there, both in the coding and in the non-coding, some of these mutations are important. So being able to annotate uh, using epigenetics uh, and, and, and profiling of chromatin, not just uh, express sequences, but also regulatory sequences, is going to be important to, to annotate these, uh, these regions, uh, these mutations, sorry. Um, Another, another important thing, uh, and, and why epigenomic and epigenetics is important, uh, and this is more similar to what Andre is going to talk about after me, uh, is that uh, epigenetic actually captures a lot of other things beyond genetics. Um, just profiling, if you're profiling gene expression, for instance, uh, independent of the genetic mutations, you can see and identify and this is a, a famous uh, paper by Peru et al., you can identify subtypes of tumors. Uh, again, this is in cancer, but you can, this is also true in, in, in various complex diseases, but you can identify subtypes uh, at the level of epigenetic that, again, might be informative in terms of treatment and, and classification and so on. So um, these, the epigenetic signature... Uh, Again, capture a can capture both the combination of the environment, a combination of, of, of genetic variants. There are some genetic variants that lead to very extreme deregulation at the epigenetic level, and again, you can you can capture that. So, um, so it's useful for annotating non-coding variants, and it's useful also in some cases to to actually classify patients in different groups. Uh, and that's a bit again what you'll see uh, later later today. Um, so, moving on a little bit to the, the technologies, and again, I, I'm not going into that in detail. Um, there, there's one thing I didn't mention, but, uh, well, I didn't, I think it was mentioned yesterday, but there are other uh, CBW workshops that are, that are specifically targeting epigenetic analysis as well. Uh, we're doing one next week, but there's one on RNA-seq as well. So, if you're interested in, in, in more details on both the technologies and and the analysis, that can be an option. But just to give you uh, a, a rough, uh, rough idea of, of uh, the technologies, uh, nevertheless, if you're not familiar with them. Um, so, you know, yesterday we were just shearing the DNA and sequencing DNA directly. Uh, here we're, we're enriching for specific, uh, specific uh, DNA fragments. So if we're interested, and this plot shows uh, we're interested in P53, which is our protein of interest in this, for this particular uh, application. So we have an antibody that pulls down uh, fragments that are uh, DNA fragments that are attached. Uh, so there's uh, two, uh, two P53, and we basically enrich for DNA fragments. So there's different step of, of, um, of actually, um, with, you know, first you actually 
uh, you link the, the, the protein to DNA, and then you remove the protein, and then you're left with uh, DNA fragments that were enriched for uh, regions that were bound by a particular protein of interest. So same steps after that, you sequence the DNA, but what you're left are with these, uh, these clusters uh, of, of reads that actually correspond to the region of, uh, of the genome that was bound by that protein of interest. So, um, so, so this is one way of starting to map what's happening in the non-coding uh, regions of the genome. Um, another example that, that maybe is, is, is even more obvious is RNA-seq. Uh, so this is uh, really just a conversion of, um, of the RNA into cDNA libraries, which are sequenced, mapped. There are some differences in how uh, the mapping and the analysis of that needs to be done because of, of splicing and all sorts of things. But again, uh, we're, not, we're not going into the details here. But uh, the idea is that this gives us, and, and also lots of different ways of preparing the RNA that you're sequencing leading to to look at poly A uh, transcripts or looking at all or small uh, RNAs and so on. So different ways of profiling regions of the genome that are expressed. Uh, the last, again, uh, sort of as a, as a quick overview, the last technology uh, that, that's quite common for the profiling of the, of the epigenome is uh, whole genome by, is bisulfite treated uh, to, to look at methylation. Um, so here, uh, through bisulfite treatment, uh, you have a conversion uh, of methylated or unmethylated Cs such that you're able to identify uh, post-sequencing through uh, informatic analysis which, uh, which cytosines were methylated. Um, again, so, so not going into that uh, in detail, but that's just, uh, th those are the technology, the main technologies that are, that are used. Uh, what I, I, I wanted to, to do, instead of going too much into the technologies, is really to show you more, again, in the context of genomic medicine, uh, how these chromatin maps, or how looking at the epigenome is, is important. And I, I'm pulling out some example from uh, the NIH Roadmap Consortium, which is with an effort in, in mainly in the U.S., uh, to, to do pro systematic profiling of different cell types. So I'll, I'll take a bit of time. I mean, this is a complicated slide. Uh, I'll take a bit of time, and I can't even basically, uh, I'm struggling to read it itself. But so here on top, you have the different cell types uh, that were profiled. Uh, so what they did were they did different types of chip seek experiment. They did a uh, different type of transcriptome ex uh, experiment, and so on. And they use that to, to define which region, again, non-coding regions, corresponded to uh, enhancers in these different cell types. So on, on, on this axis, at top, you have the different cell type. And on this axis, what you have are different traits uh, that have been mapped uh, through GWAS. So, so yesterday, um, uh, Mike mentioned GWAS a little bit. So GWAS, identifying regions uh, that, that associate with, uh, with the disease. Uh, many of the GWAS hits uh, are not in genes, and that being non-coding. Uh, so, so what the GWAS hits for these different traits uh, highlight are regions, again, typically non-coding regions, um, that are associated with a particular trait or particular disease. So if we look, um, you know, if you look, for instance, one that has all of the, these red dots is inflammatory bowel disease. And, and, and what the heat map shows is, you know, where, um, where so the hits from the GWAS, where are they enriched? In which enhancer are they enriched? And you see, well, it's a bit hard to see because it's very small, but typically, or maybe a better example is this one here. Uh, so here, for instance, you see that these are, this is liver cells, if I'm reading this correctly. Uh, and you see that enhancers, so, so GWAS hits for cholesterol, uh, LDL, cholesterol, lipid, all of these GWAS hits are actually enriched in uh, liver uh, enhancers. So, so this is a way of sort of refining uh, and sort of giving more information about these GWAS hits that are 
uh, that are non-coding. Uh, and so there's a good association, and it can help pinpoint, in some case, uh, the cell type that's relevant to that disease, but also more specifically, the, the DNA region that's, that's associated. Um, the next example is, is hopefully even more concrete. Uh, so this is also an outcome uh, of, of doing this uh, deep epigenomic profiling. So this is um, a, a neat example because um, this is, uh, hopefully I remember, so, so as you see, so this is a GWAS hit for obesity. Uh, and, and the GWAS hit for obesity uh, that was identified was, was in this region here. Um, and you see all the SNPs that are in very close LD to that SNP are shown in color. So you see that the hit is, so there's, there's an associate, genetic association with obesity that is in, in this region. And following this finding, um, and I forget now what FTO stands for, but it's, um, I forget the, the but, but basically uh, a number of, of pharmaceutical program actually were designed and built around trying to see what this gene had to do with obesity because, again, there was this very strong association in one of the introns of this gene. Um, what, what the epigenetic maps did, though, was to show, and you, you see this, well, this is now looking at high C data, which is looking at chromatin. So, I mean, if you're not familiar to, with that, it's not, not the end of the world, but this is, if you see the shading here, this is showing that this particular variant is actually associated with a very big, oops, with a very big chromatin compartment. So all of this, this region basically um, is, is in close proximity to that particular, because of course here we're looking at the gene, we're looking at the genome in sort of two, uh, just in, uh, in, in two dimension here. So here, um, you know, this is saying that this whole region is actually in, potentially in proximity to uh, this particular variant. And, and, and the key uh, uh, result here is looking at, uh, so, so, you know, GWAS hits means that people with a particular genetic variant tend to be more obese or less obese. I don't know which one it is in this case, but there's a, an association between having a particular genetic variant and the disease. Uh, and now, if they're looking at, in the right cell type, uh, if they're looking at the mRNA level, expression level, stratified by risk, uh, by the genotype, right, so whether you have the, the risk genotype or not, uh, you see that the level of expression of genes in this region, uh, FTO in particular, doesn't change. So the level of expression of FTO doesn't change no matter if you have the risk allele or not. But what you do have is, is some other genes, mainly RX, uh, IRX3 and IRX5, that depending on which allele you have, clearly there's a very big difference in expression. And so this was a, a, a big result in a way because it basically said all the work that, that you guys are doing on the FTO gene to try to, to, to understand its role potentially in obesity is not, is not relevant. The, the, what's really happening in this region and the reason there's an association is, has to do with the control of those other genes and those other pathways. And so it was a big, uh, big deal in terms of a result showing that, you know, uh, annotating the variants, it's, it's really helpful to have this type of epigenetic data in the right cell type to really sort of annotate correctly, basically, because otherwise you're left saying, well, the, this variant is probably affecting that gene, but you don't really know. It's sort of a guess. So the epigenetic information helps you to, uh, to, to, to identify that. All right. Um, so, so hopefully I, I've convinced you with those, uh, that example uh, in that intro that, that looking at epigenetic is, is uh, relevant uh, in the context of disease. So one, one way is to, to generate data yourself that's relevant, but, but the, the goal of this module is really to also talk about existing resources that you might be able to, to integrate and use already. Uh, so, so one <coughs> challenge with, with the epigenome is that there's many epigenomes, right? So it's enough to sequence the genome of an individual, uh, 
Um, but, but each of its cell type will express different gene, will have different chromatin configuration, and so on. So, so just like having a reference human genome is helpful, having sort of the reference of what's expressed in what cell uh, is also going to be helpful because then you can say in disease you have a deregulation of that gene or something like that. Um, but how do we do that type of profiling? So, um, so this work really started with, with ENCODE, which uh, consortium that you, you might be familiar with. This was really at the level of developing these ChIP-seq and RNA-seq technologies. They were developing the technologies and then applying them mostly in cell lines. Uh, since then, there's been other consortium, the NIH Roadmap, I was talking about that, where they started to do profiling now in, in stem cells and, and various ex vivo tissues. And, and this work continues now in, in what's called the International Human Epigenome Consortium. And the challenge, especially if you want to profile human cells, is, is to get human cells, right? So I don't know if there are volunteers for giving out brain cells, uh, but it's like, so it's not it's not easy to have cells from all the different tissues. So typically, uh, this is linked to different operations or something like that, where they have access to tissues. And then, you know, uh, you know at the same time, they try to do the profiling uh, of, of these various different cell types. So this is uh, a large effort, uh, an international effort that involves people in the US. Um, so we're one of the mapping center in Canada. There's another one. Uh, at the Genome Science Center in BC, but you see that there's partners in Europe, in Asia, and again, we just try to basically coordinate that. Uh, we, we, we generate in similar ways uh, epigenetic data in as many tissues as possible, and then uh, pool the data together. And so that's what I'll talk about a little bit. Uh, we can't do everything, so uh, typically, what, what, what we call a reference epigenome in a given cell type includes um, so two, uh, two histone marks that are associated with uh, transcribed genes, uh, two histone marks uh, that you see here that are associated with enhancer regions, two histone marks, um, so I didn't go in detail, but these are all ChIP-seq data sets that pull down histones that have these particular marks. Uh, and so two, two of two marks that are associated with repress region, uh, RNA-seq data, and whole genome bisulfide sequencing, as I mentioned. So the idea is to, to, to have an overview of what's happening in the chromatin in a given, in a, and in, in, in the transcriptome of a given cell type. Uh, <coughs> uh, as part of IEC, uh, we're, we are doing some, some data generation ourselves, uh, and we're also responsible <coughs> for collecting data that's been generated uh, by different groups. Um, so, so this is one of the things that we do. One challenge with, with epigenomic data and also with genomic data that we didn't talk about much yesterday, but uh, these data sets are identifiable. So if they're coming from patients, we have to be careful about the, the raw data. So the raw data ends up being put in these uh, controlled access repository, whether it's dbGaP or EGA. So to access raw data, you have to go through a, a data access committee. Uh, but then we also make available process files that are not identifiable that you can then use and, and visualize. Um, so, so, uh, so we've developed this, this portal uh, that contains many, many data sets. And so we'll, we'll go into that uh, in more detail in, in the practical. Um, so this is the portal for the international uh, consortium. Uh, there's also uh, a portal for, for ENCODE, because ENCODE, which again was the initial, um, the initial project that, that started a lot of this work, um, continues to generate data. So this is another uh, very useful resource um, that, that I recommend. Um, finally, one that's, that's I think, particularly uh, relevant for, uh, for this this uh, group uh, is called GTEx, uh, and GTEx, uh, they, they went through a, a different, uh, different approach. So I mentioned that it's difficult to get access to tissues to do profiling. So, uh, so GTEx project actually uses uh, cadavers. Uh, so this way, in the same individual, they can profile as, you know, lots and lots of tissues in a systematic way. 
Um, and, and so that's, that's a convenient way uh, to, 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 to profile many tissues. Um, the, other, the other nice uh, component of GTEx is that it's linked to, to genotype. Uh, so, so they sequence these individual, so, uh, and, and then they look for association. So, well, again, we'll, we'll see that more in the practical, uh, but uh, they look, so if they have um, three donors, so this is an example, uh, they might, so if they have enough donors and they're looking in the same tissue, whether this is a gene in, in brain, I believe, uh, so they can see, um, again, some genes will have same ex levels of expression um, across all individuals, but others will have, uh, a, a bit like GWAS, will have uh, different levels that can be associated with genetic variants. So GTEx uh, combines genetic information uh, with uh, expression mainly, um, hence the name, uh, expression uh, project. And, and so that actually allows you to identify genetic variants that in a given tissue are associated with uh, changes in expression. So that, again, I think can be very useful resource and annotation. So that's what we're going to uh, look at. Um, so this is, this is GTEx. Again, I think in the practical, um, we'll see this more. Um, so, uh, and the last one that I hear here, uh, this is just one, and there are many others, but this is one of the repositories that has a lot of the underlying uh, raw data. So again, um, you know, if, if you're interested in expression in your particular system of interest, um, it might be good to look to see if there are other data sets already uh, that you can use or that you can compare your data with. Um, uh, and that's, that's one of the resources. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm almost uh, done with the, uh, the overview, but uh, just again, a little, uh, a, a little idea of what uh, we're going to be doing in the practical. Um, so we're going to be looking at the IA data portal and how to find uh, data sets there. Um, so, you, so I mentioned, but there's different consortium that contribute data sets, whether it's the roadmap or it actually even the ENCODE data or some of it is also included here. Uh, what's more relevant is, um, is that these come from different tissues. And, and also uh, are associated with different types of assays. Uh, so we'll, we'll navigate a little bit. This is a different view of the data, so this is uh, really what we're going to be looking at. Um, from here, um, you, can, you can directly visualize the data. So typically, uh, <laughs> epigenomic data will... So, so this is... Um, can't, can't even read. So this is a histone mark. Um, so typical CHIP-seq data set looking at uh, H3K27 acetylation. So this is the profile. If you remember uh, the slide I showed you on, on these clusters. So again, uh, this is an example of just visualizing the, some of the data. UCSC genome browser. Uh, there's other data uh, browsers uh, specifically uh, for epigenomic data. Uh, WashU uh, being one of them, um, so that uh, actually has some nice features that are that are missing from the UCSC browser, uh, and specifically for for epigenome. Um, as part of the IAC data portal, you can not just visualize; you can also download the data. We're going to do a bit of that. Um, this is an image of the ENCODE uh, data portal. Um, similar things. I mean there. There's just so much data that, uh, you know, a big challenge is to build interface that actually allow you to navigate and find what you're looking for uh, easily. The ENCODE uh, portal is, is quite nice for that. So, again, that's, that's one of the things that we're going to do. Uh, uh, GTEx, a so slightly different view. So, uh, I think, uh, so this gives you an idea, though, how many data. So, they profiled 50 tissues. They have 500 donors. This was uh, a short while back. Uh, I think there's been a new release since then, so we'll see that on the portal. I think they have more data now. But still, they have 500 individuals. 
they've profiled 50 tissues or whenever possible. Sometimes there are some, some failures. Um, but, but it really allows, uh, so you see the, the number of samples in the different tissues. Some tissues end up being easier to, to process than others. Um, my, last, uh, my last sort of note of caution before we go into the practical is to say that even though these international consortiums do as best as they can to, to quality control and to only release a good data set, uh, there's still some, some variable levels of quality in data sets that you might uh, find out there. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, sometimes there's some very old data sets and some new, you know, so of course it makes a difference if it's a, a data set that's five year old when the technology, sequencing technologies weren't as good and the reads were shorter. Uh, so you, you do have to take that into account if you're comparing older data sets to your data set. So in, in some case, um, it, it might still be a good idea to, uh, to, a bit like was done yesterday, to go back not just to the process data, but to the raw data if you can, and, 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 and really sort of redo the analysis and re, uh, recheck that, that everything is good. But, uh, um, you know, one, and, and this is one of the things that we'll do in the practical, one thing that we've tried to do in the, in the data portal that we've done uh, is to, to add a few QC metrics. And there's similar metrics actually in the ENCODE portal as well. So there are sometimes some QC metrics that are associated with the data set. One that, uh, that we've implemented in, in the portal is to do just sort of simple correlation analysis because when you have replicates uh, in the same cell type, you might want to see, you know, which data sets um, uh, you know, are most similar to, to which data sets, and that might be one way of identifying outlier uh, data sets that are not so good if, if there are replicates. Um, so again, this is uh, one of the things that, that uh, we'll, we'll try to do. So, um, so with that, I think uh, I'll stop here. Take any questions if you have.